Join us in the chat every Sunday at 7 live on stream right here on this YouTube channel. Hey neighbor, I can't believe it's time to say this already, but welcome to the 10 year anniversary of SOS. This couldn't be more perfect if I had planned it, which I somehow didn't, but today is May 7th, the show is called 7 on Sunday, so I'm taking that as a sign from above. It is hard to wrap my head around the fact that you guys helped me take this tiny little countdown idea and turned it into my most successful show, which is insane. Thank you. Anyways, today we're exploring seven bands who drastically altered the recipe ingredients to get a new sound that could potentially alienate fans and make them unrecognizable, or if they're smart, push their career to that next level. Some of you remember I covered this topic back in 2017, which is why these already covered bands are not here. But if you're curious, tap the card for that and help jumpstart the anniversary celebration with the ceremonial smashing of the like button. I ain't happy. I'm feeling glad I got sunshine in a Storyboarding the changing gorilla's seasons isn't easy. Damon Alpern never stays in one place for too long, especially since this project, out of all of his projects, seems to have given us the highest amount of sonic changes. Alpern teamed up with artist Jamie Hewlett to make a cartoon band, so genre fluidity was likely always in the cards for gorillas, as they shed dozens of layers like a chameleon after the bare bones electronic hip hop found on their self titled debut. Demon Days shook the virtual and physical world upside down as the eccentric band became a mainstream pop phenomenon, spawning bigger hits than ever before with the likes of Dare and Feel Good Inc., both of which represented a further step into the alternative music space. Auburn tends to space out his commitments, as he made just two Gorillaz albums over the course of the next decade, but one of those was a crucial turning point sonically, and it goes by the name of Plastic Beach. Auburn took his love for world music, hip-hop, orchestras, alt-rock, and synth-pop to new heights as he fused together so many genres that the masterful cohesion of the third Gorillaz album just can't be ignored. Opening the door to collaboration from day one sort of future-proofed the project. MF Doom, De La Soul, Slow Tie, Beck, Kaliucha, Snoop Dogg, and that's just a tiny sample of a very long receipt. It's such a waste, you know, we could do so much better than this. Swimming in pools of pub and terry these guest collaborators keep Gorillaz sounding fresh, almost like working out with a different trainer each month of the year. Auburn's always keen to think outside of the box, look to the Song Machine series or the underrated album Humans as proof, and yes, sometimes it's to his detriment, but more often than not, it seems to hit that sweet spot that keeps fans invested, guessing, and building the world of Gorillaz right alongside them. Before I get to sleep, cause I've been rocking this party eight days a week. Legendary hip-hop group The Beastie Boys held down a very specific forte in rap for decades. They pretty much always dared to be different, from the samples galore Paul's Boutique, all the way back to their early days as a punk rock band. Wait, what? The remnants of their former punk band The Young Aborigines changed their name in 1981, and if you've never experienced the OG sound, allow me. Pretty crazy shakeup, except it's kinda not. I mean, the Beastie Boys branded themselves as honorary punks, even though the music didn't necessarily match the sound of the movement by the time they got to the release of License to Ill. Let's run that back. Punk band builds underground following, puts out comedy hip-hop track in 1983 and it goes over well, and by 1986 they're topping the Billboard 200 with a Diamond certified album that has very little to do with punk rock. For their second act, we witnessed a massive lane shift as the B-Boys tirelessly stitched together a huge collection of samples. This jaw-dropping second record gave them new life in the eyes of critics, continuing to crush it with the anything but ordinary follow-ups, check your head, and ill communication. From the 
Beastie Boys were lethal MCs, but just as importantly, they were damn solid musicians, which gave them an edge to escape being typecast as immature frat bros. They went on to earn the respect of everyone in the rap game for doing things their own way, which to me proves that punk rock is a state of mind. Turnover started off humble enough as a pretty straightforward pop punk band with lyrics in the realm of angst, as you might expect, before quickly drifting off into the unknown in one of the most puzzling sonic shifts I've ever witnessed. Change is the only thing that you can always count on with Turnover, which is admirable, especially when taking a closer look at the flawless masterpiece Peripheral Vision they turned in as their sophomore record in 2015. <laughs> That record's dreamlike quality blended warm shoegaze bliss with melancholic reflections of the past, showcasing a massive step up from their fine but not game-changing debut, Magnolia. Even their 2014 EP Blue Dream championed a new wave of finesse that they didn't have on day one. And when we fast forward to 2017's much sunnier LP Good Nature, you're hearing a band that's totally locked in with three back-to-back solid-as-hell releases that never stagnated. Dream Pop proved to be too irresistible for Austin Gitz and company to not explore further, resulting in a dreary, spaced-out afterthought of an album called All Together in 2019. It was around this time that they started feeling like they were isolating themselves into this lo-fi hipster den intentionally. They withdrew to the shadows, which I think is cool if you're letting the music speak for itself, but it felt like their entire brand became, let's make our entire aesthetic look like the equivalent of a 240p VHS tape. Turnover was completely unrecognizable within a few quick steps, but never more than on their 2022 comeback piece, Myself and the Way, that nearly completely threw melody and traditionalism out the window in favor of ambient, jazzy lounge pop with some mild guitar innuendo. This royal band needs no introduction. Freddie Mercury is arguably the greatest frontman of all time, and his bandmates were the entire package. They planted their first flag with a hard rock sound that encompassed their first three records, hitting a breakthrough with the Queen 2 cut seven seas of rye that Mercury had written for his sister. Changes to the formula were evident by the time of the mainstream friendly plot twist Sheer Heart Attack, but it wasn't until the near total departure we found in the now iconic news of the world that came in 1975 that things would really change. Each member somewhat calmly fought for directional control over the years, with each record generally having the caveat that someone in the band would get to try out a new trick. This often worked out extremely well, as it brought about some of their biggest classics ever, although it wasn't full proof. For example, the trend chasing that they flirted heavily with in the 80s as their relevancy waxed and waned like a lighthouse beacon. The A-listers returned to the top 10 with the synth-pop smash Radio Gaga and an album in 1984 which yielded several other smashes that felt like a fully recharged queen. This surge reignited their fame and led to one of the greatest performances ever given, Live Aid 1985. Freddie Mercury was the voice of a generation, and in many ways, that's what defined Queen no matter what genre they dabbled in. Although his health declined throughout the 80s until his untimely passing in autumn 1991, he rarely let it show to the public, remaining a force to be reckoned with all the way to the grave.
New Jersey legends My Chemical Romance put out a burst of unique colors in a relatively short amount of time during their reign in the 2000s. Born from the ashes of the 9-11 attacks, MCR's first album Bullets mirrors the tension the United States was feeling, albeit in a much more emo, post-hardcore, vampiric kind of way. Major labels went into a feeding frenzy after that record sold incredibly well for an independent album, with Warner Brothers winning out and giving them the budget and the producer to make something much bigger than just just some goth kid fashion statement. Three cheers for Sweet Revenge kickstarted an immeasurable surge in popularity for My Kim and the entire scene they were attached to. The album's roots were firmly planted in post-hardcore, but in a much slicker, fiercer, cohesive, gut-punching package. Three Cheers is an all-timer, but the glow-up was insane from that to their rock opera The Black Parade released just two years later in 2006. Band leader Gerard Way followed his comic book instincts to make an album that's equally intelligent, heavy, dark, interconnected, and masterfully performed, brimming with pretty much every good character trait you could ever want in a rock album. Their next and final studio album, at least as of now, was a drastic turn from the morose theatricality of the Black Parade. Enter Danger Days, the true lives of the fabulous Killjoys, their biggest gamble yet with tons of glam, more pop-friendly tunes than ever, and a kick-ass cartoonish attitude. It's always been difficult to paint a proper portrait of My Kim because they're always shaking up the Magic 8-Ball, whether it be a cover of Bob Dylan's Desolation Row in 2009 for the Watchmen soundtrack or in 20. 13 when they unleashed some b-sides that sounded unlike anything they had done up to that point in time. Upon their musical return in 2022, the single Foundations of Decay highlighted their inability to stay put just for the sake of nostalgia, choosing instead to always push their boundaries in a fresh direction. If Depeche Mode stuck with their original style, I'm sure that they would be remembered fondly, but as one of the greatest bands to ever do it, unlikely. If their career could be seen as a shadow lurker, then album one was the oddball out there basking in the sun with a drink in hand. However, there's a good reason why this sound didn't stick. Founding member Vince Clark wrote all of the lyrics to speak and spell and left the band a mere month after its release. A slow but noticeable shift occurred in Depeche Mode after Clark's sudden departure, with Martin Gore volunteering his much darker thoughts as lyrics. After this, the synths remained, but with a very different effect and intention, as Fletch, Gore, and Alan Wilder packed a wall-to-wall -wall sound with their trademark keys, landing a darker blow by the release of Construction Time again, before quickly giving way to the tortured Black Celebration in 1986. This is the I'm definitely not saying that this is where they stopped innovating or taking risks. In fact, it's definitely the opposite. But the pessimistic outlook generally stayed in place, with Dave Gaughan's one in a million voice helping guide their albums through the seas of synth pop, grunge, trip hop, and even industrial rock. From the all-time classic Violator to the enthralling career renaissance Memento Mori, Depeche Mode are a long way from home, but the melodies and monuments built along the way are still standing, with a taller-than-ever influence across multiple generations. It's kind of shocking that so few seem to know that Fleetwood Mac were a band long before Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham, and they used to sound a hell of a lot different. Fleetwood Mac formed in London in 1967 and were originally known as Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac after their original frontman and rhythm section mainstays Mick Fleetwood and John McVie. The version of this band that most of us recognize and love swings with a much more fluid motion compared to the rougher blues rock inspired folk only seen pre-Buckingham Knicks. I've got things to do, I move every day. Hope you don't mind, cause I'm going your way. 
After a bad acid trip abroad, Green all but lost touch with reality and eventually left the band after one last album, which to his credit is a great one, then play on. After his departure, the Revolving Door lineup officially began, as a duo of Bobs joined the band with Bob Welch taking the role of primary vocalist. Christine McVie also started contributing around that time, joining officially by the early 70s and paving the way for the massive success just around the corner. Here I go again, I see crystal vision. Now who could have ever predicted that two kids from LA would join the British band Fleetwood Mac in 1975 to change the tides of music? It was pure magic, like puzzle pieces changing shape based on where or what they needed to fit. The romantic and drug-fueled drama within the band became a monster of its own, as the band sold tens of millions of records, flexed their creative muscles as a unit, and went on an immaculate five-album run between 1975 and 1987 with that classic lineup, although none of the records, as stylistically diverse as they are, had much in common with the distant sonic waves they rode in on decades before with Peter Green. Damn, it feels good to celebrate this milestone. Let me give you guys a virtual hug. Thank you for tuning into the 10 year anniversary of Seven on Sunday. I appreciate the love that you've given it as we've grown the show into what it is now. Smash that like button and throw away the key because there's a new SOS every Sunday in May. Connected episodes are right here on screen and I'll see you next week with more.